שלום לכם. אם תשאלו מדענים, תגלו שרבים מהם חושבים על תקשורת המדע בצורה מאוד דומה. מבחינתם, תקשורת המדע זו הגישה הפופולרית של מחקר מדעי. מדענים שמספרים על המחקר שלהם לציבור הרחב, בהרצאה או בתיווך של התקשורת. אבל תקשורת המדע לא מוגבלת למונולוגים של מומחים שמדברים על מאזיניהם המרותקים. בתקשורת המדע יש גם דיאלוג, והקשבה בין מומחים ולא מומחים, השתתפות במחקר והשפעה על מדיניות מצד בעלי עניין מגוונים. לשמחתי, מי שיעזור לנו לעשות סדר במודלים השונים בעזרתם ניתן לחשוב על תקשורת המדע, הוא, פרוס, הוא פרופסור ברוס לוינשטיין מאוניברסיטת קורנל, מהאבות המייסדים של תחום תקשורת המדע בעולם. וכדי שנוכל לשוחח, אני אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. Today we have the privilege of welcoming with us Professor Bruce Lewinstein, a member of the Department of Communication and Chair of the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. Professor Lewinstein, who studied and teaches science communication for over 30 years now, helped catalyze and enable the development of science communication as a field of research and practice in many countries, including here in Israel. Shalom Bruce, thank you for joining us today. Shalom Ayala, I'm glad to be here. So scientists know important stuff and everyone else doesn't. So we need to figure out how to make sure that everyone knows about it. So that people can live more interesting lives and make better decisions. Isn't that what science communication is all about? That's what those of us who are in the science community wish that it was about. But it turns out that when we've actually done research on science communication, it turns out that just delivering information doesn't actually achieve those goals of helping people have more information or improving their attitudes or appreciation. Researchers call this the deficit model, the idea that there's just people have a deficit of knowledge, a lack of knowledge, and all we have to do is pour in the knowledge and then everything will be better after that, whatever everything is. But it turns out that doesn't work. As I said, we have um, gen more than two generations of data now. Uh, showing that just providing information doesn't actually change people's attitudes or uh, behaviors in any particular way. So not everyone is interested in science in itself. You say that most people need science to be relevant to their lives in order to care. Can we simply present people with the tailored messages that will interest them because they will be relevant to them? So that certainly helps. Um, and we, we call this sometimes the contextual model. We have to pay attention to the context in which people are. So until two years ago in 19, 2019, nobody cared about how we made vaccines. Now, suddenly we all care about how we make vaccines and, and how we test them. Um, but, it's go, but the contextual model goes beyond just what people might be interested in in the moment, because that's still a form of deficit model. model. The problem is, is that we have to recognize the context in which people are. And so we have to recognize that they uh, may not have time to gather information because they're caught up in their own personal situation, or that there's historical reasons why they don't trust scientists. So for example, in, in the United States, the African-American community has good reason to be suspicious of the medical institutions and therefore doesn't necessarily want to listen when the uh, medical institutions say you should get a vaccine uh, or other medical information. So the contextual model, although it helps, it still doesn't get to the underlying context of why people are not necessarily receiving or using scientific information. When science meets society, it usually involves more than just science. Other types of knowledge, like economic factors and values, for instance. How can we incorporate all of these when communicating science? So this is a really critical thing, is to recognize that science is not one thing, and it's not the only thing in society. That people living, are living their lives, and they're making other kinds of economic decisions, and they have other forces on their lives. And this leads to uh, what's called the dialogue model. Sometimes some people call it the public engagement model. The idea that when we want to work with communities we, and with people, we have to listen to them. We have to engage in dialogue and we have to try to understand what their concerns are. Why are there 
uh, what are the economic issues that might affect them? For example, again, here in the United States, people can't necessarily take off from their jobs for an hour or two to go get a vaccine uh, injection uh, because they don't have the economic security to, to do that. That has nothing to do with whether they believe in the vaccine or not. It has to do with whether they can afford to put food on the table. So as science communicators, we have to engage in real honest dialogue, two-way dialogue to find out what the issues are and figure out we have to figure out then what is it that we have to change and what we're talking about in order to start building trust with uh, the people, the communities that we're talking to. And that's really the key issue is building trust. That's ultimately what turns out to be the most important thing in whether people listen or act on the information that we give them. Well, we discussed different goals of science communication from defending science and marketing it to people, to engaging and deliberating with the public. Can the public also participate in creating new scientific knowledge? Yeah, this is one of the most exciting areas in science communication that's emerged in the last 10 or 20 years. It's an area that some people call public participation in scientific research, other people call citizen science. And this is the idea that ordinary citizens can be part of the scientific process they can be part of gathering data, they can be part of analyzing data. Uh, this is something that exists worldwide. I know there's a project on monitoring butterfly populations at, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, and there's a couple of different forms of this. Some of this are projects that scientists are interested in and they need lots of data that citizens can help gather. So things like the butterfly project. But other times you have projects where citizens are worried about something in their community. Often this is a water quality problem, for example, and they will design their own project. Maybe they'll ask scientists for help, but ultimately it's their project and they're trying to change something in their, society, in their community. Uh, and, so, and they're using the scientific process to, to do that. And that's also a form of citizen science. It sounds a little bit like a hierarchy or something that is being evolved or developed. So when we get to a higher level of science communication, do we just abandon the, the lower ranks of science communication or do they co-evolve, coexist? It turns out they, they have to coexist. There's, uh, uh, um, you can't have the public engagement model or the citizen science model without also having some information transfer of the sort that, de that the deficit model happens. And so these things overlay itself. It happens that uh, there have been several recent papers that have taught research papers that have really tried to pull this together. A researcher from Australia named Jenny Metcalf has just presented what she calls the nexus model in which you have all of these things overlaying each other, all of these models happening and and really you can begin to understand how different publics at different moments are looking for different kinds of information. And, and as communicators, we need to engage with them in different ways. Um, a couple of other researchers have just published a paper in the United States, uh, Dietram Schäufele and Dominique Broussard and some of their colleagues about uh, the different forms of public engagement and especially recognizing the political implications of public engagement models. The fact that this is about sharing power. This is about the idea that in a democratic society, although on the one hand, we believe that scientists have knowledge and have expertise, as you said earlier. On the other hand, we believe ultimately it's up to the population to be making decisions. And the public engagement model is about trying to find the balance there and recognize the differences there. Professor Buslemestein, thank you so much for joining us today. We will meet again towards the end of this course. Leitraut. <laughs> Leitraut.